my finger off. Using a mandolin, making, uh, actually cutting out some of the squash that you gave us. <laughs> so <laughs> this was <laughs> your fault. <laughs> Yeah, it's a different one, that's for sure. Yeah, the uh yeah, I was not gonna repeat that. John had too much fun with it. Did you wash that before you brought it here? Wash what? The the vegetables. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually cut it when I was cleaning the mandolin. Oh, okay. So it All wasn't right. even like with the food. <laughs> yeah. So no. I was just giving you a good time. It was safe and separate. <laughs> All right. So um Last, well, two weeks ago, we started talking about the idea of the kingdom and how the kingdom of God is kind of this story that runs throughout Scripture that helps us to understand what heaven is going to be like. And you may think, why are we going to talk about the past kingdom, or even tonight, talk about the present kingdom in order to understand the future kingdom? And the reason it's because the future kingdom is not something just that God had to dream up as plan B in response to kingdom A falling or in response to even this period that we're in right now. This isn't a God restarting his plan and trying to make something out of a bad situation. It's not a life has given God lemons and he's trying to make lemonade. This is God's plan for what his kingdom was going to be, what his purpose for us was going to be, has been set in stone since Genesis. And the garden is a place where when we look at them, Adam and Eve, how they were supposed to rule and to reign in harmony with one another and in harmony with God, they represent what we were supposed to be. And the story of the Bible is one of God restoring us back to that. So the kingdom that was is kind of the seeing the fall of God's plans and the fall of God's, like this kingdom of Israel in the Old Testament, and it not fully working. But there's this promise at the end of it, of a coming day where God's going to restore his kingdom. And we read last week Isaiah 61 and talked about it. The reason why is because in the story of the kingdom of God, You have the founding, the fall of kind of this earthly kingdom where sin infects it. And then you have this moment, this crux of the story, where things seem like they're in their most dire state. And God radically intervenes to change the trajectory of what's going to happen. And that's where Jesus steps into the picture. So Isaiah 61, where we read about God restoring his kingdom, is found in Luke 4 where Jesus goes into his local synagogue, it says he came to Nazareth, starting in verse 16, where he had been brought up. As usual, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written. Now, I'm going to go to Isaiah 61 so that I read the full chapter of Isaiah 61. And the reason being... um, that when in Scripture, when you read like a little short quotation from an Old Testament passage, that was how they would reference where they were going to. So like if I tell you, have a 1 Corinthians 13 type of love, you know the reason why I can do that is because guys, uh, a couple men and scholars in the past thousand years, or maybe I don't remember exactly when it was. Do you remember, Toby? invented chapters and verses in the Bible as a way of marking uh, these for easier reference. But Jesus, in their time, when they're referencing like a psalm or a passage in Isaiah, they would start off by just quoting the opening lines of it. It's why Jesus, when he's hanging on the cross, quote, cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's a psalm of David that starts with despair, but Jesus is trying to call the people's mind to what's happening on the cross where the righteous is being condemned but ultimately will be found rejoicing in the salvation of his God. And so it's not Jesus just despairing, it's Jesus is saying, remember this passage in Psalms? And it seems true right now like God has forsaken me. 
but there's a redemption coming. And whether, where are you going to fall on that? Well, Jesus starts quoting the first few verses of Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because the King has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. Remember, this was a message of hope that was written to generations that had long died before Jesus enters the world. So this was a message of God bringing a day of restoration that hundreds of years have passed since, and it has not been fulfilled. So Jesus standing up and reading this, this wouldn't have been lost on his audience as they've been looking forward to this day when the kingdom starts to be restored. Because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of our God's vengeance, to com- comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, festive oil instead of mourning, splendid clothes instead of despair, and they will be called righteous trees planted by the Lord to glorify him. I'm going to pause there. Because we're going to walk through the remainder of this chapter of Isaiah and see what exactly Jesus is saying he's about to begin. What exactly it's going to look like when God starts restoring the kingdom. And so I know, Derek, you're going to have to skip down a little bit. The first thing is he says in Isaiah 61, 3, they will be called righteous trees planted by the Lord. You see that the end of Isaiah 61, verse 3. And they will be called righteous trees planted by the Lord to glorify him. You know, Psalm 1 says, talks about the righteous man, that he will be like a tree planted beside streams of flowing water. And when you look at the history of Israel and this people who have rejected Jesus, or who have rejected Yahweh as their God, who have squandered the things that he has given them, They're not life-giving trees that are planted that bear fruit for others and support and sustain and bring life to their environment. Instead, they become people who say, mine, and try to capture everything for themselves. If you remember when we talked about what was the greatest sin of Sodom and Gomorrah, was that they had pride, they had plenty of food, and they did not, and comfort and security but did not care for the needy among them. It was all about providing for themselves and making sure they were safe and they were secure. And it's the same thing, the same arguments that get levied against Israel by the prophets, that they don't care for those who are needy among them. They see their resources as something to bring comfort, security, and much food to themselves, not to care for their neighbor. And so... They will be called righteous trees planted by the Lord to glorify him. It's kind of a holistic picture, this first one. They will be Psalms 1 type of people who are known to be righteous and holy, not to walk in the counsel of the wicked or the scoffers and the mockers, but instead to delight in the Lord and to bear much fruit because of it. This is a heart type of change that's being promised. This is a radical transformation of the people of God. Next, they will rebuild. In verse 4, it says, They will rebuild the ancient ruins. They will restore the former devastations. They will renew the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Strangers will stand and feed your flocks, and foreigners will be your plowmen and vine dressers. And the idea of all of this is one of, the people who are going to be part of this new kingdom as it starts to restore are going to be people who are of great benefit to the people and society around them. They're not going to be people who just take and consume for themselves. They're going to be people who, even when they are in the middle of corrupt and evil uh, countries and nations and generations, who see everything about how they can provide for themselves, the new people in this generation will not reflect that. They will be people who give, who bless, 
who bring benefit to their neighbors who are made in God's image. They will be people who are an addition to the society around them. They will be people who bring prosperity, but not for selfish consumption, for the blessing of others. That's why you think about Paul. I had a conversation with someone uh, this week that made me think about this, where Paul writes about, let the person who is lazy learn to work. Why? So he can stop being a burden on other people? No. Paul says so that he may give. The Christian is transformed to serve. That's why we're being radically transformed into righteous trees in this kingdom. You know, there, I was, uh, I don't remember if it was a podcast I was listening to or a book I was reading. It was a book I was reading this past week um, by David Platt called Don't Hold Back. It's one of his newer books that he just wrote. And he's talking about this kind of give it all mentality for building Christ's kingdom on this earth. And one of the refer- things he references in there is a study that was done looking at developing countries who had made huge growths as nations to bring prosperity and health and increase the uh, length of the average length of life in these countries. And you know what the common factor was in every one of those countries that had massive growth in those areas and the ones who didn't? Sustained missionary work by Christians for a period of time in that country's history. It was the single greatest contributing factor to whether or not these countries grew that way. Like, that's remarkable. And the reason why is not, it shouldn't be, it honestly shouldn't be a surprise to us. Because Isaiah 61 said, this is what God is going to build his kingdom into. When his kingdom is being restored, when it's going from that that valley where it got to its lowest point to now Christ has changed the direction and it's on the back up, it is going to be a group of people who are so radically changed by their God that they rebuild the broken down and devastated places around them. Why? Because they care for the souls of the people who are in those broken down and devastated places. Because they are going from being people who, in the hands of Satan and their own selfish desires, are being instruments of death, to in the hands of their Lord and with their radically spirit-filled new heart, are being instruments of life to the people around them. And then, they will be called priests. All of us. There's a doctrine called the priesthood of the believer. We don't need a priest to stand up and act as a middleman between us and God anymore. Christ has torn the veil. In this kingdom, every person is a priest. And it's not a kingdom that's based on geography or on a certain people group. It is a kingdom based on those who have been radically changed by Christ, by the Messiah, to have their hearts be like righteous trees. And in this kingdom, every believer, every person of this kingdom is a priest to God. Someone who advocates on behalf of those who are not with God to be restored to him. That's the whole point of a priest. The priest served to go as a go-between between the people who were distant from God to God. They held, essentially think of them as holding hands with God and holding hands with people and saying, I will not let either go. And that's what we're called to be. We're called to be that to each other to a some degree where we minister to one another, we advocate to one another, be reconciled to God. You know, this area of life that you're struggling in that's hindering your walk with God, so pursue Him. Like We do that, but the real way that we act as priests in this world is by reaching out to those who do not yet know God and seeking to reconcile the two. It's going into a dark place that has been ruled by death and destruction, expecting that they are going to bite and kick and hate it, 
and saying, I care enough for you, I'm not willing to let go from you or from God. I won't be corrupted by the world. I will hold fast to God, and I will not let go of you and let you fall away from him. So much as it is in my power. We cannot save people. That's not what I'm saying. But we can appeal to them. That's one of the great benefits of being in a country with religious freedom. There's no religion that is compelled upon the people by the government. Which means this. It is about who is the most persuasive. If you want people to follow your God, you have every opportunity to persuade them. They have every opportunity to call you out, to reject it, to push back against it, but you have every opportunity to keep persuading them. We have every right to go to someone and appeal to them to be reconciled to Christ, but we also have to consider how we do so affects how persuasive the message is. A priest who stands in the temple of God in the Old Testament and who allows his sons to go and do wicked things and not correct them, which is a real story that happened, incurs judgment. Why? Because they might have had the right orthodoxy, the right beliefs about who God was, but they did not have orthopraxy, the right practice about who God was. So as we come and we act as priests, we do it both with our mouths and with our lives. And where those two things do not meet, people will not be persuaded because it's not a very convincing message. And so, they will be filled with rejoicing. You know, you think about, there is a lot that can be difficult about this world. But do you remember the stories of the early Christian believers that even when they were in the middle of persecution, it says that they would rejoice, that they had been counted worthy to be persecuted for the sake of Christ? What kind of kingdom inspires you to think about that? It's the type of kingdom where you know that you are actively waging war and fighting against something and you're threatening to it. That you're rejoicing in, it's the same reason that people on the front lines of Ukraine right now have joy that they get to go and fight and lay down their life for their country because they're thinking about the day when their country is finally safe and their wives and children can return home and not be threatened. So if I go there and I have to stay in the trenches and I have to do all of this, as miserable as it is, I do so for the sake of what I know will come when we win. And that's why the early Christians could do so, because they knew they were on the winning side of this. That's why Paul said, run your race. Like, finish it well. And do so, so that you know you gave everything in your life to bring this kingdom now. And know that even when you die, the moment your eyes open up, you will see that kingdom brought to its fullness. So what is a little suffering now? It's not even worth comparing with all the glorious riches that God's going to give us when we finally see that. When we finally see no more wars and divisions and kingdoms of this earth, but everyone united in God And that's what verse 7 says. In the place of your shame, you will have a double portion. In the place of disgrace, they will rejoice over their share. So they will possess double in their land, and eternal joy will be theirs. We get the double joy now of knowing that we are pursuing and experiencing parts in this life of the kingdom that is to come. We get to experience the wonderful type of fellowship where brothers and sisters come together and love each other in a way that we don't see in the world around us. Where we can have relationships where we are known and not so that they may take advantage of that knowledge, but so they may build us up. Where we can have relationships where in you and in me, 
we get to experience more of who Jesus is, who, is we, who we ultimately were designed to love and seek after to begin with. And this is the joy that we get, but it's not compared to the eternal joy we know is coming when the kingdom is fully established and Christ is back. They will be secure. It says, for I the, lo- lo- I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and injustice. I will faithfully reward my people and make a permanent covenant with them. For those who buy into building this kingdom, there's no removing them. There's no POW in God's kingdom. You're not taken away where God has to barter and trade for you. You're His. And you go out and you advance His kingdom and you make it known and you love the people around you and you make the places where you are, and the, whether it's your job or your school or your family or your wherever you are, and you take those environments and you actively seek to shape them to be more like the kingdom that is going to come. And you can know that no matter what happens, he will not let you go. Your God holds you secure in those moments. They will be known and recognized Verse 9 says, Their descendants will be known among the nations and their prosperity among the peoples. All who see them will recognize that they are a people the Lord has blessed. Now, this is not true of everyone who has ever called themselves a Christian. Because we can look around and see plenty, plenty of people who take the label Christian, plaster it on everything that they do, on their bumper stickers, on their Tattoos in their arms even, all over Facebook about how they're a Christian. And when people look into their lives, they see it's just as bankrupt as theirs. Because it's easy to do superficial things and say you're a Christian. It's easy to say I'm a follower of Christ. It's hard to constantly lay down your life and pick up your cross and follow him. To die to yourself to die to the sins in your life, and to see following Christ as worth more than anything in your life so that when people look at you, they see that you're blessed. Now, that doesn't mean that every situation in our lives, even when we're faithful, that people will think we're blessed. Think of Job. But what it does mean We as Christians should not be known as a miserable and bankrupt people. There should be something that is so life-changing about the message we have that people see us rejoicing in our sufferings and count us as blessed even if we're not fully welcomed and embraced by the culture around us. That was one of the things that changed Christianity from being a persecuted religion in the first two centuries to being the official religion of the Roman Empire was because even the people who were persecuting them could not deny that they were a blessed people and God's favor was on them. That even when they were persecuted and mistreated, they blessed the communities around them. It was, I mean, we have actual letters of Roman officials writing and saying, we are persecuting the Christians, yet they treat Roman citizens better than we do, and the Roman citizens know it. That's how you win an empire. That's how you bring a kingdom But see, it's not about winning over Rome. It's not about winning over America, ultimately. It's not about winning over Britain or any other country that we can think of. It's about being kingdom bringers, whether or not we're in favor with the country and the people around us. To be people who, when they look at us, they say they are blessed, and the people in their lives are blessed by them, and I despise them for it. I can't stand some of what they say. But when people look at them, they can't deny 
what God is doing through them either. That's what we're called to be. A people who are known and recognized because it is evident God's working through us. They will be known and loved by their God. Verse 10, I rejoice greatly in the Lord. I exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation and wrapped me in a robe of righteousness as a groom wears a turban and a bride adorns herself with her jewels. Again, imagery there of God loving us like a bride or like a groom loves his bride. They will be because God is. And this is maybe the most radical thing that happens in all this. For as the earth produces its growth and as gardens enable what is sown to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. It's not us that causes it to happen. It's our God who is faithful to his people. It's a God who promised in Ezekiel 36 when he's talking about this new covenant that he's going to make with his people, one that will be a permanent covenant and will not falter. He says, I will take their heart of stone out of them and give them a heart of flesh. I will sprinkle them with water and clean them. And I will place my spirit in them and cause them to walk in my ways. The difference between the kingdom that fell and the kingdom that we are experiencing right now, which is a kingdom that is coming, or in the sense of a kingdom that is slowly growing to be more and more full of a kingdom in this world as it spreads out and Christians go out everywhere and take the gospel with them and take the the benefits of living according to God's ways with them, That's the kingdom we currently reside in. It's a kingdom that, like Jesus said, is not of this earth. It's a spiritual kingdom. It's a kingdom that unites you and me to our brothers and sisters who are in Pakistan right now in a house church at night, staying up till 2 o'clock reading their scriptures. It's the kingdom that unites you and me with our brothers and sisters in India who are going to religious or Hindu temples to share Christ with their brothers and sisters and family who are there. It's the kingdom that, set, or that binds you and me to our brothers and sisters who are serving in Romania right now that we're going to take a mission trip to in a couple of weeks to go and serve alongside with. Or to our brothers and sisters in Habersham County in North Georgia, who are working on planning a bilingual church up there. It's a kingdom that goes across all borders because the marker of this kingdom is not geographic. It is not skin color. It is not language. It is nothing other than God has set his loving affection on people made in his image from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And he's called me and you to do the same. To go out and find those people. And to bring his lost children home. It's a kingdom that goes. It's a kingdom that we're called to labor, to bring, to fruition. And as much as we draw close to God, we serve as greater and more effective instruments in bringing this kingdom to be a reality. So that one day, we will close our eyes and open them and see it in its fullness like it's intended to be. But until then, we labor, we fight, we bring this kingdom now. And we love the people around us like how God has loved us. Let's pray for a few minutes.